Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The workday has just begun at Free Recycle Nigeria, a facility dedicated to tackling the issue of waste tires by transforming them into reusable rubber molded products. The day starts with the arrival of a fresh batch of used tires, collected from the company's affiliated vendors. The company has recycled over 300,000 tires in its four years of operation, and aims to recycle 5 million scrap tires annually. Hence, reducing the issues of waste tire management in the world. Because yearly, millions and millions of these tires are burnt. So what we try to do is to withdraw those tires. The more we buy, the lesser tires that will be burnt. And the lesser impact, um, the lesser effect it will have on the environment. The tires are first fed into a tire debeater machine which removes the metal wires or beads embedded in them. This step is crucial for two reasons. One, it makes it easier to shred the rubber into tiny pieces in the upcoming steps. And two, the workers are left with pure rubber that can be molded into any desired form. The machine uses hydraulic force to pull the tire apart and separate the metal wires. The metal wires can then be collected for recycling, while the rubber moves forward in the recycling process. Next, the de-beaded tires are manually placed one after another on a conveyor belt, which will feed them into an industrial shredder. The shredder breaks down the tires into smaller chunks of rubber. While large rotating drums further crush these pieces into smaller fragments. Throughout the process, workers prioritize safety by wearing face masks, since operations like these produce rubber dust which can fill the factory air. The fragments that meet the desired size are transferred to another line, while larger pieces are returned for further crushing. The fragments move to the other line pass through a magnetic belt, which extracts any remaining metal particles from the shredded material. Lastly, the rubber crumbs go through a final vibrating screen that sorts the rubber into various sizes that the company has categorized. We have different um, categories. We crush it into 1mm, which is powder. We have 3mm, 5mm. They are different sizes. It comes out that way. The final rubber crumbs are then poured and mixed in heated mixtures where a polyurethane binder is added to help the crumbs bind together, along with coloring pigments. In the case of making rubber pavers, the molds are first covered with a thin layer of polyurethane binder and the colored rubber mixture. Undyed rubber mix is then added as the top layer in the mold. The molds are then manually pressed by hand as the first step of the compression, stacked onto trays that are moved into a hydraulic press, 
which acts as the final step of compression. The final step involves transferring the molds to an oven where they are left to dry for about eight hours, which gives them their durable and robust properties. Once dried, workers remove the pavers from the molds, bundle them into stacks of 10 bricks and secure them with tape. According to Free Recycle, these rubber pavers are ideal for creating footpaths or school playgrounds and offer significant advantages over traditional bricks. The advantage is this. One, is safe, extremely safe. If you fall on it, you get back up. No injury. If your phone or any other thing that you're holding falls on it, it's also safe. In addition to this product, the company also manufactures a range of other items, including rubber mats, flip-flops, and more. Overall, they ensure that used tires are repurposed into new products, rather than being burned and contributing to environmental damage. Although tire recycling significantly contributes to the betterment of the environment, not all tires are as easy to recycle as the ones used in passenger vehicles. Unlike traditional tires that are filled with air, some heavy-duty vehicles use foam-filled tires for added durability and safety. These tires are designed to provide consistent performance by replacing the air with solid foam even in harsh conditions. The first step in removing a foam-filled tire is to cut through the dense foam. An industrial saw is used to carefully cut through the outer rubber and foam layers, ensuring that the foam remains intact for removal while allowing access to the inner structure of the tire. The cutting process must be precise to avoid damaging the tire's internal components. This particular tire belongs to a JCB telescopic handler vehicle, which is commonly used in construction and heavy lifting. These vehicles often operate in rugged environments, where air-filled tires would be vulnerable to punctures, leading to costly downtime. Foam-filled tires provide the reliability needed for such demanding tasks, ensuring the vehicle can continue working even in harsh conditions, including sharp objects, rough terrain, and constant pressure. Removing the foam is typically done in sections. Forks of a forklift are used to carefully lift and separate portions of the foam from the tire. Since the foam is dense and firm, sectioning it helps break it down for easier disposal or recycling. Once the foam is removed, the outer rubber is detached from the wheel rim. This is done carefully to avoid damaging the wheel, 
which is then prepared for a new foam-filled tire. Foam-filled tires are usually replaced after extensive use when the rubber wears down, or the foam loses its cushioning ability. Regular maintenance ensures the continued safety, efficiency, and performance of the vehicle. In addition to tires, plastic has also become a significant environmental threat when improperly discarded. However, a recycling factory in Pakistan is taking steps to reduce the damage it has caused. Trucks loaded with giant heaps of discarded plastic bottles arrive at the facility. Once unloaded, the immediate step involves removing the stickers present on these bottles. This is because the stickers are usually made of different materials, such as paper or synthetic plastic, which can contaminate the recycling process. The next step involves sorting the bottles based on color and feeding them into the shredder. This machine breaks down the bottles into tiny plastic fragments and takes them through a washing process to remove any impurities or dirt. The crushed material then falls into a pool of water where plastic pieces sink to the bottom while other contaminants like non-plastic materials float to the surface. A worker then manually clears out these floating materials. The cleansed plastic fragments are then crushed further, dried and blown out to the storage area. Workers then pack this finely crushed material into large plastic sacks, which will be sent to recycling facilities such as this one, that use this material to manufacture PVC pipes. The first step in making PVC pipes involves blending crushed plastic materials with additives to enhance their properties. Stabilizers help the pipes withstand heat, plasticizers make them more flexible, and coloring pigments give them the desired appearance. Then enters the most important machine in this facility. It's called an extruder, where the raw material is heated to a high temperature. The extrusion process involves melting the plastic and then passing it through a mold or nozzle to form the desired shape of the PVC pipe. The quality and size of these pipes can be adjusted depending on the requirement. Once calibrated, the pipe undergoes a cooling process, during which cold water sprays solidify the material. After hardening, a cutting machine slices the pipe into standard lengths. Finally, 
The finished pipes are neatly stored and organized, ready for packaging and shipment. While Pakistan is making strides in recycling plastic and contributing to environmental conservation, another company in Northern Ireland is addressing various other waste types with the same goal of sustainability. Welcome to Bryson Recycling in Northern Ireland, a waste management company that has been operating since 1993. The company directly collects recyclables from households in their special curb sort trucks, which use separate compartments for various types of waste. To make this process more efficient, households must sort their waste into color-coded boxes to sort items like paper, glass, and plastics before collection. The trucks then arrive at the facility and start unloading their collection of the day. Glass bottles, plastic and paper are unloaded in their respective unloading bays. Telehandlers organize and compile the waste into dunes to maintain space for the next batch as it arrives. They also feed the plastic and paper waste into a feeder that takes the waste through a conveyor belt. Here, the waste is manually checked and sorted as it passes through. The company also has a robotic arm that identifies and categorizes different materials for more precise separation. After sorting, plastics and cans are sent to an on-site station, where they are compressed into compact units for easier handling. The result comes from the other end as compact bales, improving storage efficiency. Innovations and initiatives have boosted waste management to a completely different level today. They have helped pave the way for a cleaner, greener future, ensuring that waste is managed efficiently and responsibly for generations to come. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.